cross-examination. A podcast by your host, the nationally renowned criminal defense attorney, Neil Rockheim. This is Neil Rockheind. Welcome to another edition of Killer Cross-Examination, the podcast where we try to uh, discuss all issues of criminal defense, criminal justice, um, and uh, we try to, to help you get more justice in the legal system and more justice in your own lives. Um, and I am super honored today. Uh, I don't think it's possible to make my guest blush, but I'm going to give it my, my, a whirl here. Um, there are a handful of lawyers, a handful, I, probably even only two or three, that really need no introduction, but are entitled to an introduction. Growing up, um, there were certain figures in the legal system that I admired, that I looked up to. And I've said this, that if I had, there were lawyer baseball cards, um, my next guest, our, our guest, uh, his baseball card would be untouched. It'd be in plexiglass. It'd be behind a like security area and be in a safe and nobody could touch it. Um, our guest today is Effley Bailey, um, who really needs no introduction, but I think I, I just want to say um, Effley Bailey has been involved in some of the most significant, most important criminal defense cases and civil cases in our history. They range from the Sam Shepard, uh, who was, so we'll talk about that a bit, the Boston Strangler, um, the uh, Milai Court Martial, Patty Hearst, O.J. Simpson, and on and on. Not just that, but he's authored, I think, uh, is the total of something like 20 books, 22 books? 22 coming up, yes. <laughs> and um, it's a privilege for me to actually talk to, to Lee. I know he's got a new book out that we're going to talk about that I read which um, uh, discusses his authorship of the defense of O.J. Simpson that resulted in really probably the most significant acquittal in, um, in the last uh, you know, 50 years and maybe beyond. And I really wanna to, to have a chance to expose a lot of the young people to one of the great legal minds, memories, vocabularies, personalities, uh, I think to ever grace the courtroom, Lee. Welcome to uh, to Killer Cross Examination. It's uh, uh, you can't tell my wife thinks that I, she, I shaved. I even put on cologne, and you're you know halfway across the United States. She's like she says, "Who are you meeting?" And she says, "Oh, it must be Epley Bailey." Well, uh, let me make an observation. If you treat your wife half as nicely as you treat me, you must be a happy man every night. I do okay. And she's, she's, uh, I appreciate that. Lee, I, one of the things that I, I want to talk to you about all these cases, I probably don't even have enough time. Um, but let me just sort of get some background, if you don't mind, share with me, um, you at the age, I think the ripe age of 33, you graced the cover of Newsweek magazine. You were a legal sensation at that time. Can you sort of f fill me in how you ended up going to law school, how you chose to be a lawyer, and um, um, how you got your start? Well, the ironic answer to those questions is I didn't. Uh, I got shoved sideways into law school by being in the military, where I was a fighter pilot, I thought, till the day they handed me a book and said, you're also uh, our counsel now for this squadron. You'll be defending courts martial. And I said, why me? I haven't finished college yet. Um, I don't know any lawyers. I don't like lawyers very much. And I don't like courtrooms. And I said, uh, you know, in the Marine Corps, if your name begins a BA, you volunteer for a lot of things. And you volunteered for this job. So I took it. I got in the courtroom, I found out, you know, this is kind of a neat place to be. And pretty soon I was spending as much time there as I was in the air. The Marine Corps then came around and said, you, you do pretty good. How about signing up to make this a career instead of just a four year uh, enlistment? I said, oh no, I want, to, I want to get out. I want to go to law school. I want to be a lawyer and I want to go out and kick some ass. 
So were you were you a were you a JAG officer in court before you were actually a a you graduated law school? Long before the military ran out of lawyers frequently, uh, particularly in the air wing, where not many uh, lawyers wanted to go to learn to fly. They just wanted to get in in two years and get out. If you wanted to be a pilot, you had to go for four. So uh, they created a special military occupation specialty called MOS. My primary job was 7333 jet fighter pilot. My secondary job was 0108, legal officer, non-lawyer. Now, a legal officer, non-lawyer could try a case anywhere but the highest court and could advise on documents, wills and trusts and things, provided he got a licensed lawyer to sign it off. So uh, I learned a great deal in the Marine Corps before I ever got out. When I got in law school, I distinguished myself by combining the two records, which I think stand today, the highest point average in the history of the school, coupled to the worst attendance rate in the history <laughs> of the school. And indeed, the dean once told me, if you went to val valedictorian, we would throw you out. So did you, did you just take to it right away when you were in the JAG and you were trying cases? Did you just feel like this was your calling? You, you were meant to do this? Well, you, you know, having been uh, double promoted a couple of times when I was young, not a very good idea, by the way. I was uh, smaller, uh, less physical, than all my classmates because two years is a lot in adolescence. And I always looked for the small pond if you wanted to be a big frog. And I got in military court and found these were all tadpoles. They didn't have any frogs and you could do a little homework and go in and be uh, a, quite a daring new fellow. And it was a lot of fun too. Cross-examination is to this day the most challenging operation I have ever put my mind to task. Well, and, and that says a lot because of all the things that you've done, including, you know, flying planes. And um, uh, I, I, I wanted to ask, Lee, and I'm just going to kind of jump into it. Um, your, I'm going to give you some quotes, see if you remember these and tell me about these, and then we'll talk about some of your courtroom experiences. Um, you once commented that cross-examination in the United States is not generally particularly good. True. Tell me why you think that. I agree with you, but you're the master. So I want to hear why you think that. Uh, whether I'm the master can't be determined. We don't have any schools, nor do we have any certification. Uh, in England, for instance, if you were to be allowed to cross-examine a witness, in a case of importance, you would have to be a barrister. That's law school plus two years of specialty training, much the way we handle our medical profession. In the United States, there's no such thing. I stepped out of law school, passed the bar, and was trying a capital case within four weeks. Is that the, was that the case involved? Was that, that wasn't the Sam Shepard case. That was the case that involved the Polygraph, was that, um, that George Edgerly? Is that the first case that you tried? George Edgerly was called the torso murder case because we didn't have a head and we only had one leg. So Lee, you another point, you said those who think the, that information brought out at a criminal trial is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth are fools. And that is true. If everyone were going to have the tell the truth, we wouldn't have a trial. We'd simply all tell our stories. They'd all work together and <laughs> we'd the papers and go home. This is a battleground where lying is the principal weapon. So you've seen that. You've been in court and you've seen people who are, first of all, I'm sure you've seen people who are deluded into believing that somehow that we're in a search for the truth. As Gerald Chargell, I'm some, someone I, I know you know well, he once said, if the legal system, if a criminal trial is a search, is a search party, uh, I'm not part of that, uh, that party. Um, 
cross-examination by you has been described as like the most important weapon, the most important tool in this battle. Do you still believe that to, to this day? I, I do. Any case that has a real controversy in it, and by that I mean factual. If it's a legal controversy, that's for the appellate court, maybe the trial judge, maybe the U.S. Supreme Court. And I enjoy that branch of the practice, and I've had a couple cases in the U.S. Supreme Court. But the factual challenges in the trial court level are almost all different. Once in a while, you see a replication, but normally there's a new wrinkle everywhere down the line. And therefore, like flying an airplane, there's one essential rule if you're going to cross-examine. You better be able to see way down the road and what's going to happen in an hour or two, or at least figure it out, or you can get caught with your trousers on a day when you forgot to wear your belt. I, I want to... I want to follow up with that because you're you have a particularly you have a unique um, approach in how you advise other lawyers things that they need to do when they cross examine. Um, I, I've read that you're not a, a, a believer that lawyers should stand there with a big outline in front of them. I never carry a piece of paper to any podium except I might in the US Supreme Court, just because I don't want them to get impatient while I reach behind me looking for a book. If I can't keep it in my mind long enough to deal with it at the trial or the appellate level, then something has gone wrong with my mind. I trained my memory when I was very young because I was very lazy and instead of doing my arithmetic where the teacher could see one and one makes two and so forth. I did it in my head, wrote the answers in the answer column and got expelled twice. They accused you of cheating until they looked at your, the, the students who are sitting nearby you and realized that those students had wrong answers. Well, it was worse than that. My mother was a prominent educator when they threw me out she came storming down to the school and said, show me the papers of each of those who sat within his visual range. Well, I would have a 90 and they'd have a 72. She said, which one did he copy from? <laughs> you know, someone once said that, mo that mothers who weren't lawyers were some of the best cross-examiners ever. I'll go to one better. When I was a young man, I took to the law and argued each case with my wife and the muscular strength which it gave to my jaw has lasted the rest of my life. <laughs> Tell me the source of that one. Who, who won those arguments? You or her or did, were they draws? Well, we don't know who won them, but what was the source? That's a quote. I believe it. I believe Not it. In Wonderland. So in your, in your book where you actually teach lawyers about your cross-examination and i have that book it's a big book and I, I read it from cover to cover i passed it around to the lawyers in my office because i wanted them to read it you actually advocate that lawyers should train practice memory they should practice met remembering things or trying to constantly tell me why you do that why do you think that lawyers should constantly practice expanding their memory because if you require yourself to divert your gaze from the eyes of the witness or other speaker, normally the witness, it could be opposing counsel, might be the judge on a rare occasion, it might be the juror. While they articulate their thoughts in words, they will add to the expression with their eyes in some fashion that is often of value. And if in order to get the next question into your head, you have to look at a piece of paper, you have to look away from the eyes and you might miss something which tells you, brother, I'm not in the tank yet, but I'm awful close, a little uh, sure. I love it. And I, I've i read your, your style is over the years and I wanna, you've advocated, don't take your eyes off the witness. You've 
said that watching the witness constantly, you can look for signs of struggling. Um, and by not having notes that it allows you to dictate, you, you said speed. I don't, and I know you don't mean haste, but I know what you mean. Tell me what you mean by not using notes allows you to, to watch the witness for signs of struggling and it allows you to, 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 to use speed as a tool in cross-examination. Well, by keeping your eyes on the witness, generally, but mostly on his or her eyes, it opens an avenue of communication that will usually give you a warning as to when the witness is beginning to feel uncomfortable or perhaps very uncomfortable. And that's an invitation to look for a chance to pounce like the tiger suddenly from the left or the right, but they hit the witness with an unexpected question, such as while talking about blue bonnets on a sunny day, you suddenly shift to the fact in 1942, you testified on January 8th that you saw a man in a green suit commit murder. Did you not? I don't remember. I'll show it to you. I now remember. That was a lie, wasn't it? I don't remember. The witness is pretty much washed up at that point. Leah, your style. Uh, I love it. I watched, uh, I watched the Jose Simpson trial. I was a prosecutor uh, back then, I have to confess. Jerry Spence has told me I still have to make penance for that. Ah. Um, what, what county? Uh, uh, because I lived in Michigan for 10 years. Uh, Oakland County. Oakland County. So. Well, I, my most famous case was uh, uh, the trial of Judge Jerome Bronson. He was a witness. He was an appellate judge who took money and later blew his brains out. And he had charged a fellow, a criminal, with perjury before a one-man grand jury. And we brought a judge down from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan who was superb. And uh, Jerome Bronson got laughed off the bench and the witness got acquitted. Um, and the trial was in Pontiac and I loved Oakland County. Well, anytime you want to come to Oakland County, you have an invitation out. I can rustle up a hundred people who would be absolutely happy to, they'd be happier to meet you than almost anybody else, particularly all these lawyers. They would, they would love to, to, to meet you and talk to you. And because we're just outside Detroit. So I spoke there many times and I believe I had lunch at the last luncheon place of Jimmy Hoffa about a, a week before he did. Ah, interesting. That'd be like the Maccus Red Fox in, uh, oh, yes. in, Bl in Blimpo Township. Yep. So I, I, I know the things that have been described about you, people have said um, that you have a swaggering style. They talk about your, your, your rapid fire memory and your rapid fire questions. I think they've said that watching you cross-examine a witness at times is like watching a, 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 a cat sort of play with a with a mouse um and i and i i wanted to tell you that i want to ask you about some of your use of those experiences use of those skills in court um i watched the oj case from minute to minute from beginning to end and and i'm going to ask you about the mark Furman cross-examination because you just wrote a book about the case and it was obviously a big deal but to me, the best cross-examination I've ever seen, ever, was you cross-examining Sergeant Rossi, period. End of story. And I no doubt you remember that cross-examination. It was the first one I did in that game. It's still on YouTube. I encourage anybody that wants to watch how you corner a witness, please watch F. Lee Bailey. Go to YouTube, type in F. Lee Bailey cross-examination, and you will see him absolutely turn a 20-year experienced veteran into a puddle of mush. Well, Tell me how you did that. You just joined a fairly exclusive club. The people who claim they watched 
the O.J. Simpson trial and really watch snippets on the evening news will pat me in the back and say that cross-examination of Furman was just absolutely superb. Uh, number one, it wasn't. Number two, it was never concluded. And number three, it was won by some audio tapes, not by me, although I gave it a shovel on the way. Those who say I love the cross-examination of Sergeant Rossi are people who know how to cross-examine. Tell me, tell me what you, because I watched you do that. Um, to this day, Lee, I, when I'm cross-examining a criminalist or someone who responds to the scene, I, I, my kids laugh at me because they'll, they'll come into my room and they'll see me on my TV, have your cross-examination playing on my television. I'm sort of a, a nerd in that way. Tell me, when you started that, you, you didn't have a note. I didn't see a note on the, on the podium. So were you re did you know that he was going to be that kind of a witness that you could shove around like that? Yes, I, I had a pretty good measure on Sergeant Rossi. He was, um, I'm sure he was not the valedictorian of his class, but he was a decent man. He tended to follow the book when he could. And when I knew the book was giving police officers bad advice, I'm talking about the manual, I would exploit it and say, well, Sergeant, the next thing you probably did was this, wasn't it? And he's going to remember what the book said to do, not what he actually did, and get caught off track. Now, those people do not wind up you know, like a, a puddle of uh, melted butter in the center of the plate, just completely dissembling. They wind up not being very important witnesses when the jury comes to evaluate the whole case. I, I have watched that. I can't tell you how many times if, if that were a um, if that if that video were a carpet and and the 10 minute segment or I've actually watched all of it, but the highlights of it, but I've watched it all. That it would be worn through from my watching it. Well, you know, it's been on YouTube for years now and as many people watch Rossi as they do Furman. It's a better, it's, it's such a good example. So tell me when you were watching Rossi, because I know you remember, when did you first, were you watching, you were, what were you doing as he's testifying on direct? Uh, just taking into account everything he said and making sure it didn't conflict with something I already had him committed to in some police report or even an off the cuff remark out in the hallway that I had picked up and had a witness who could testify to it if Rossi would have balked. Are you a note taker, Lee? When witnesses are testifying, are you a note taker? I've never taken a note in a courtroom. And one of the reasons is I told you I'm a lazy SOB. I can't write. I have never exercised penmanship except in scrawling my name, which is unscrutable. And uh, uh, I was taught to letter in the first three grades of my education. And if I have to letter, well, good example, all through law school and all through the three times I've taken the bar, I've been allowed to type the narrative answers because otherwise I couldn't finish. I get hand cramps after about 10 minutes doing this like most lefties. Who's, um, so when you're, so you, how did you keep track of contradictions or inconsistencies? You know, I like to think that unwittingly I made little boxes in my mind where things would fit if they had a certain shape or size or even tone or tenor or timber, something that set them apart. Or if they had a little flashing light saying this is going to be uh, this is going to be important down the line nail it down so the guy can't change his testimony and no one would think that was an important moment until an hour later i said by the way an hour ago you said it was red you said it was green are you colorblind no did you make a mistake no i said explain to the jury how red became green i just leave it there 
I don't care what he says. When did you, Lee, when did you, um, in, in the, the, one of the things that I hope that you'll allow me to pay this compliment on is that I believe that when you were cross-examining Rossi in particular, you were really in the moment. You didn't let him just give you the slip with throwing in qualifiers or particularly when he talked about his, that he, he was, he, he knew he hadn't destroyed any footprints because he didn't, he didn't see any. Um, a lot of lawyers would have just looked in their notes and kind of moved on to the next subject, but you just pounced on it. Well, it, it, bear in mind, there was something to accomplish with Rossi in my mind that uh, uh, was important as kind of a benchmark for other witnesses to look at because all of the witnesses could watch each other on TV and get a sample of the cross-examiners. I had a feeling that most of the, of the witnesses in this case in LA had never been exposed to my style or brand of cross. Oh, I'm sure they hadn't. Well, <laughs> I sure wanted to give them a lesson on what would happen to them if they hedged, fudged, or turned something upside down that didn't belong upside down, and very frankly, to intimidate them. And the other thing I wanted to understand was, if I said, sir, didn't you say, and I quote, that that was haik verba, word for word. And if they said, I can't remember, they were gonna see it in writing. And if they said, yes, I said it, they were gonna be asked to explain it. But it was not a destructive corner but it was a pattern that the next batch of witnesses could see coming. Unfortunately, Johnny Cochran thought I did such a good job with Rossi. He said, we, we'll have to let some of the others have a chance. <laughs> you have a high opinion of Johnny Cochran as a, as a person and as a lawyer. Uh, Johnny Cochran became, since we were kind of smashed together under adverse circumstances, became one of my closest friends, and the tragedy was, I had a sense that Johnny Cochran was very, very sick, even during the trial, and I couldn't get him to go and see a doctor, because he didn't want to face up to what the doctor might find, and 10 years later, it turned out that he died of a benign brain tumor, which he probably could have survived with treatment. You stayed in contact with him all th after, after the trial, Lee? I've talked with uh, the only fellow at the trial, for the most part, is Carl. But Johnny Cochran went out, and a bunch of people gave him $20 million to invest, started the Cochran firm. There's a, a branch everywhere. There's one here in Atlanta. I know most of these people. I lecture for them a lot. I'm very... Uh, friendly with them, and they've got a bunch of good lawyers, but more important, they're good people. And when you are out on the road and you have to rely on local counsel to get things done in your absence, you want to make sure you've got good people signed on the papers with you. Um, there was another cross-examination that I read about where you used the same sort of tactic um, and it was in the Patty Hearst case. I want to talk to you a little bit about that. For, I'm going to come back to the, 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 the Hearst case itself. But you cross-examined um, a doctor. Was it Dr. Fort? Was that his name? His name was Joel Fort. And it's unfortunate. But yes, he was a doctor. Um, and the the description of your cross examination of your confrontation with them ranges from aggressive people. Someone said you were snarling. The prosecutor actually objected to you curling your nose. I'm not sure how you do that. Um, and he objected to you lifting your eyebrows. Uh, do you remember that cross examination? I remember vividly. And I was using every gesticulation apart from my larynx to say you're a phony son of a bitch. Tell me about that. What what happened that was, what, because I, I followed it and I know where I want to, I, I know, I think I know what you were doing with it, 
But tell me what you were doing with the cross-examination of, of Dr. Uh, Joel Fort. Well, I, I was frankly angry because Joel Fort had come to me and tried to get signed on as an expert for the defense. And he had all kinds of things he was going to say for Patty Hearst. I already had the four top people in the United States. Joel Ford is a guy that probably contributed to the death of Lenny Bruce by feeding him drugs all the time. And he had a terrible reputation, no medical competence that I could see. And I, I dismissed him. Uh, no, thank you, doctor. We, we have a full plate here. So then he went over to the prosecution. They were desperate for anybody with a license and they signed him on together with an old grandfather who didn't know anything about brainwashing from Boston, Massachusetts. When they put Fort on the stand, I was seething and I tried to keep my temper from overriding my alleged skills in cross-examination. But when Fort was turned over to me for cross, I said, Dr. Fort, isn't it true that you tried to fix this case? I, I was going to ask you about that. So you and he went back and forth. That was a classic. Now, one of the things that he did was it seemed like he had taken um, information that he had learned from either you or others about the case in the defense. And then he wrote a book or a, uh, or he, was there an article or a book that he had where he had sort of taken these things and he, he, he wrote a learned paper to himself <laughs> and an audience of one and it was based on alice in wonderland so tell me about that how did you how did you when you saw the paper that he wrote to himself how did you cross-examine him to point out that that was that he was just making it up just to be relevant in the case because I wanted to ridicule him, not just destroy him, but to ridicule him and get the world laughing. And I must tell you, uh, blowing my own horn, jurors after the case came in said this guy was a joke. Why did they ever put him on the witness stand? But uh, Joe Ford had this elaborate construct of how Patty became a radical. And he had written a paper to himself drawing lines and connectors and so forth. And it was all taken from Alice in Wonderland. And I recognized the language, just like I threw it at you early in this program about arguing each case with my wife. There's a lot in Alice in Wonderland to pluck out and have fun with, but you better know where it comes from. And you can be embarrassed. When I asked to see the sheet from which he was reading, the prosecutor had a connection. The judge, who at that point was really out of it, he, was, he died a few days later because he was a very sick man. Uh, but he let me have it. And I said, Dr. Ford, it appears that a good deal of your wisdom, as spoken from the witness stand, derives from the wisdom of Lewis Carroll. Is that true? Well, I think so. I said, are you hesitating because you don't remember the name of the author of Alice in Wonderland. Oh, that's <laughs> devastating. <laughs> so, Lee, I, I'm, you know, you have, um, you participated in, I mean, so tell me about the, I, I, I mean, I, I would have chuckled if I were in court watching that. <laughs> Did anybody chuckle and laugh? Uh, we had our share of chuckles throughout every trial. Indeed, there's a maxim out there, and I'm not sure you and I will bet our lives on it, but laughing juries seldom convict. And I had a terrible case in New York one time. Only thing I had going for me was the prosecutor was wearing a wig and it kept falling off. He kept putting it on sideways. And I would go over to the jury box and wink at them and they'd break out and laugh and he'd straighten out his wig. By the end of the trial, I'm not sure if they knew why they were there, but they were laughing too hard to vote guilty. So I, I have heard the laughing jury is uh, is a in a quitting jury. I, I I'm not gonna I don't want to use a pun. I think the jury's out on that one. I I think that some juries they laugh because they're looking for a way to ease the tension and there's some humor and then they they can easily convict. 
Um, so let me ask you about the Hearst case. Yes. Patty Hearst, yes. you are one of the, you're probably the, you're the only lawyer, I think, in history that has participated in two trials of the century, right? I mean, when Patty Hearst was put on trial, the newspapers called that the trial of the century. They did, but prior to that, the Shepard case was the trial of the century. And prior to that, the Strangler case was the trial of the century. So this is a recurring phenomenon and the label is available for whatever group of newsmen gets benign authority to christen a trial. Yeah, except that there's one constant through all those, those cases, Lee, and that's you. Well, I didn't have them all, but I sure had more than my share. So tell me about the Patty Hearst case. So first of all, good decision to get involved in that case, bad decision, or do you just look at it as it, it's a decision and it's part of your history? You know, every story has a story buried in it. And the Hearst case was different than them all. I was in prison, in a woman's prison in Mississippi, talking with another client who was doing life because her baby had died. She claimed that it wandered off and had the whole neighborhood out looking for it. And they, they punished her uh, with a conviction of first degree murder. And we were talking about her appeal. The warden came to me, and this only happened once in my life. And he brought me his phone. And he had a plug extension, brought it all the way to the visiting room. And he said, Mr. Bailey, I don't take calls from lawyers in this institution, but for you, sir, you have a phone call. And I took the call and it was Randolph Hearst. And for those that don't know, in, in, in his day, Randolph Hearst was, I don't know if he was the wealthiest guy in the West Coast, the United States, but he was, who would you compare him to now? Well, I mean, Warren Buffett could buy several Hearst, but William Randolph Hearst, who owned St. Simeon Castle and really ran all the Hearst publications was probably the wealthiest man. Randy had enough money so that when we asked him for a check, he didn't seem to notice the amount. So, and I've read two books about the the, the Hearst trial. Uh, I was fascinated. I've really been fascinated by your career and just fascinated by your style. But you haven't read the big one. I've read I the big one, and I've and I've read the I've read this one. I've read. The, you know, the No Deadly Drug, and I've read the one that you are, is about to be released, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. No, no. The book about to be released is strictly OJ. I know. I read the big book about cross-examination. I have never written about Patty Hearst because she asked me not to. And then she went and wrote a book confessing to the one score we'd had in the case. I, I, I started to tell you, I flew to San Francisco yeah, tell me the story. Mississippi, and Randy Hearst met me in his living room at about one in the morning, and he was a wreck. And he said, Mr. Bailey, quite apart from what you've read, I'm afraid they're close to charging my daughter with a horrible first-degree murder. And if she gets charged, our lawyers tell me she'll never see the light of day again. And during a bank robbery, a pregnant woman was shot in the belly with a sawed off 12 gauge shotgun, killing herself and her fetus. And when they got the body to the emergency room at the hospital in Sacramento, where the police first took it, the doctor on duty lifted the sheet covering the face and found himself looking at his wife. Oh. That's a bad case. Patty had been in the getaway car as you know, felony murder, you're in all the way. Carried the death penalty in, in the California. Jimmy Carter had commuted her federal sentence. No one ever gave her any immunity on the murder except one string, use immunity with the FBI. And when she wrote that book, I don't know what idiot told her to do it when she wrote that book admitting to participating in first degree murder. She almost got herself indicted in Sacramento where the Carmichael Bank was located. The DA 
was hopping mad and said if Carter uh, pardoned her, he would indict her. So he got commuted. So I got blamed for losing the Hearst case. Was it a winnable case, Lee? Was it a winnable case? Well, we had no winnable case. I mean, when you blow up 20 police officers and cars and six police stations and rob two banks and fire a machine gun into a crowd, you got your plate full without the murder case. And we walked around with three years. I don't think she got a just result. I think she was brainwashed, but I think she got a good result, particularly since she could be getting very gray right now with no chance of release. But you, you put, as I understood it, her family, or maybe her father, put you in a bit of a box with, um, and tell me if this is true or not, with her defense. So the defense was that she was brainwashed, but then there were challenges with what she had done afterwards and after the crime. Is that is that a fair assessment? Yes, I mean, the, the case was a nightmare. Randy Hirsch never put us in a box. The family was delightful. They asked me in the first hour, can you save her from the murder case? And I said, I don't know, but if it's federal, it's going to be tough. They don't like pregnant women getting shot in federally insured banks. I'll give it whatever I've got. And Randy Hearst came up to me once I got her immunity in the murder case. And he said, you've earned every penny and a lot more. Well, you know, it's, it's sad because the, the pundits, who wrote the last book about that case, Jeffrey Tubin. All these guys uh, write these. Call Jeffrey a pundit, or you could call him some other things right now. <laughs> Jeffrey Tubin was 17 years old when the Hearst trial went on and had no business at all writing that book. But you see that I've read these books and they, they talk about the trial, but this is really, we could do a whole show about what people don't know about the Hearst trial because people don't know that any of what you're telling us. But I couldn't tell them until she wrote a book two years later. I get it. It was a horrible violation of the attorney-client privilege. Now, Tubin, I can tell about the minute it turns out that he likes beating things better than writing things. <laughs> yeah, people will be able to figure out. I think we'll all be able to figure out what you're talking about, Lee. And, and, and Giuliani, not too far behind. <laughs> so a couple of, um, a couple of questions I, I want to ask you about. Uh, so the Patty Hearst trial, I know I've asked you about. Um, and I have to go back to the OJ trial because there was a recent, I'm a big fan of, of your style of cross-examination of your approach. Um, and I know the, the Furman cross-examination is something that people talk about. You just gave us an assessment a few moments ago. You said that it, I'll let you, I don't want to read, how would you assess Furman's cross-examination? I know it was unfinished because he took the fifth, but how would you assess it yourself looking back at it? I think Mark Furman had a moment when he lost the ball game. Now, I must tell you that the jurors who talked to us extensively afterwards at a Christmas party said Mr. Bailey was wonderful, but we didn't really need Mr. Bailey. We knew Furman was lying the minute he sat in the witness chair. So, you know, he did not make a good impression, even though he was a handsome guy and at first blush appeared to be reasonably intelligent. Uh, the cross-examination was badly interfered with by Judge Ito because he made a ruling I've never heard before. I had certain witnesses willing to testify under oath that Furman used an ugly racial slur. The N-word. And everybody knew who they were I shared them with the prosecution. And Marsha Clark got her uh, ego to rule that until the witnesses testified, I couldn't question Furman. That bifurcated the testimony into now and later. Well, that's a terrible way to have to cross-examine a witness. And it's not even consistent with the rules. So I said, what am I going to salvage here? The minute I shut down, I'm not going to see Furman again for months. So I grabbed the bull by the horns and I said, 
Mr. Furman, you're telling us that anyone who walks in this courtroom and tells this jury that within the past 10 years, you've yearned the N-word is a liar. Is that what you're saying? And he said, yes, I am. And I rolled my eyes and I said, all of them? And he said, yes, all of them. Well, that told the jury lightning didn't strike twice here. He used the word a lot without ever producing the witnesses. I would say at that point, if it were my case, I'd have found a way to settle for a dollar and a half and run next door to Nevada. <laughs> when you, how did, it, it, it turned out that Furman was, he, he participated in some really extreme coaching sessions in the prosecutor's office. Is that right? They tried to coach him. I, I must tell you, in my assessment, they didn't do a bit of good because you couldn't tell Mark Furman the sun was up and have him believe it, even though he was looking at it. He was a completely recalcitrant person. He was offended that they were taking him in the grand jury room to give him a training session. And very frankly, nobody in that room knew how to train a witness, particularly a compulsive liar. And so, they, they, had a, they had a psychiatrist in that room, right, Lee? They had a psychiatrist that was working with him? There was a psychiatrist in the room whom I embarrassed in open court. And- uh, I remember. And they had a fellow in the room named Alan Yokelson, who was a good fellow, maybe a good trial lawyer, but he certainly didn't know much about training witnesses. And training witnesses needs to be done. It's important. I don't believe Furman is trainable. I think lying is something that's just built into his blood like a politician we've all been dealing with for some years. And he does it compulsively. Lee, had you been given the opportunity to cross-examine, to finish the cross-examination of Furman, had he not pled the fifth, using just the, the two examples that Judge Ito gave you from all those tapes, and I want you to talk about that. Can you, can you walk me through sort of extemporaneously how you imagine you would have finished off Mark Furman on the witness stand? How would you have done it? Yes, uh, when all was said and done, I would have like the roll call that was read out by Johnny Cash's great song about the Alamo. Davy Crockett, Randy Travis, and a run through the list of names. And so, Mr. Furman, you tell this jury on your oath, they are liars, liars all. Is that so? And I don't care what his answer was, I would have sat down. Lee, you have such a great command of the English language. I don't know if it's, because I don't think that you use, and you have a term that for lawyers who choose, a term that lawyers who use big words, you have a term to describe those big words. What's that term? Um, like $50, 50 words or something like that? No, 50 cent words. 50 cent words. You don't use words like that, but somehow the, and I'm paying you a compliment, just your diction or your pace is really mesmerizing. Well, Has it always been that way for you? I've always had success at speaking, articulating, conveying thoughts, but there are several ingredients. Number one, you've got to have the resonance in your voice to get the sound to the listener. Number two, you've got to have the ability to enunciate. And many people mumble, slur, and you miss part of what they say, particularly when you get to be 88 and your hearing isn't the best anymore. You have to listen more carefully. Enunciation is terribly important. Speed, either very quick or very slow and deliberate. If you've got the witness by the throat, you only want to kill him softly and slowly. <laughs> uh, all of those things are part of an inventory, even an arsenal, that need to be matched up to the guy on the stand. Uh, I must tell you, 
my favorite cross-examination. I was going to ask you that. I was going to ask you, well, who's your favorite cross-examination? My favorite cross-examination occurred in a civil case when I had the chief executive officer of Raytheon on the stand. And I knew that he was a somewhat pompous man because he went to church uh, every Sunday with my brother and uh, led on that he pretty much ran the world, the industrial military complex and some other things. And he had refused to pay a commission in the purchase of a company by Raytheon. And so a suit had been brought for the commission. And when I had him on the stand, I said, now, um, I understand that you sometimes describe yourself as Mr. Raytheon. Is that true? He said, well, I suppose I've said that. I said, no, no, you said, I am Raytheon. Have you not said that? Well, I probably did. I said, now using all the wisdom that it took to get you to the very top spot in one of the very best companies in the United States, wouldn't you say that based on what you've heard, your company owes my client some money? And he said it would appear that way. That, that right. my friend, is that's a great in the world. That's the best cross. Okay. I, I'm going to, you have so many. I'm going to ask you just to, I want to ask you about some of the, who's the best lawyer you ever saw? That's, that's from the right stuff where they asked uh, Gordon Cooper, who's the best pilot you ever saw? Who's the best lawyer you ever saw? Uh, probably Edward Bennett Williams on a very limited view. Now, there's another one in Georgia who just died a little while ago in the 90s named Bobby Lee Cooper. And I would not, in Georgia at least, want to run up against Bobby Lee Cooper because he'd have me so covered in grits in the first half hour of the case. I wouldn't know the name of a single juror and maybe the judge, but he was sharp. He's got a, a, a shadow, not a shadow, but a lawyer here in, in Atlanta who retired, quasi-retired shortly, named Eddie Garland. Eddie Garland can talk me under the table just by lapsing it in a dialect. So if I get in a case with Eddie Garland, I'm moving up north just as quick as I can. Okay. Um, Lee, tell me, uh, I'm going to ask you some names. So just tell me what you're, so Nathan Lane played you in the, in the, the series on, uh, what was it on HBO? And people Netflix. like OJ Simpson Netflix. on Fox. On Fox. Um, what do you think of Nathan Lane's portrayal of you? I thought he did a good job. Uh, I thought he got exactly the right words. He ended his cross with, and all of them. And Nathan Lane is a nice guy. What irritated me was that the people at Fox knew that I was hostile to their project, even though I thought that taking down Shapiro was a barrel of fun. Uh, there were a lot of false things that were meant to convince the public OJ was guilty, which is just cheap journalism. But Nathan, I liked. Uh, he played me, Christopher Plummer has played me, a young lawyer played me years ago and got killed two days later in a Porsche. I mean, I've been around the park when it comes to alter egos, uh, and I've been played by some lawyers I thought were so bad, I wouldn't let them in the courtroom. Do you guys have a few more minutes for me to, to ask you a couple more questions or? Okay. <laughs> Marsha Clark. Marsha Clark was uh, certainly not the right person in the right place at the right time. Now, there's an anomaly here which no one has ever sorted out. This case was to be tried by Bill Hodgman. Bill Hodgman was the top guy in the office, probably administratively, but he tried some cases. And he had some kind of medical event just before trial. No one knows what it is. We assume maybe cardiac related, and the case fell in Marsha's lap and the police department groaned because Marsha Clark can be as nasty as a bottle of vinegar bored in your martini. 
but I do not believe that Marcia has ever shown a great deal of skill. And had there been a witness that you could have cross-examined and turned upside down, and the defense really didn't have any of those, I'm not sure Marcia could have done the job. Now, I wouldn't pick on her, except she was nasty to me. She was. And I wouldn't forgive anybody for anything except being nasty to me. She was nasty to you. What did you think of the way that she handled um, her beginning of the direct examination of, of uh, Mark Furman? The old, I want to get out in front of it. Let me, let me own it before the defense goes into it. What do you think of that? Well, she used what she thought was a technique called stealing your thunder. And that is before you get to cross-examine my chief witness, I'll bring out his little peccadillos. That works when you've got a good witness who has screwed up maybe once big time, did his time, laid it on the table, get it out front, sure. But she was putting a thunderstorm on the witness stand. She could never have spent enough time going over his lies to rob me of the opportunity to hit him over the head with it. So she started out on a note that most people know about, the letter been published. That's not the way you introduce the only witness that can tie the defendant to the crime. The only witness. This was a case about a glove, and that's all it was. How would you have done it differently? As you're listening to her begin her, her direct examination of Mark Furman by trying to steal your thunder, so to speak, were you, were you grabbing your knee? Were you, were you rubbing the sides of your mouth like a Cheshire cat? Were you, I mean, how would you have done it differently if you were her? I mean, obviously not calling Furman and dismissing the case according to your book, which I'll talk to you about, but, but what, what would you have done differently? I thought to myself, you know, she's got her handle on the wrong throttle. And this is not the time to open it. And I gave her credit for having a lot of balls. Okay. Um, all right, one last OJ question about the, uh, um, about the glove. Everybody probably has asked you about the glove. So the courtroom demonstration on the part of the, the prosecution was one that you wrote that you sort of um, maneuvered or goaded Chris Darden into doing. True? Orchestrated is a fair word. What's that? Orchestrated is a or fair word. Orchestrated. Would you tell us about that in as much detail as you want? Tell us about that. Obviously, throughout the case, the glove was hovering in the background, always a threat to both sides that we'd have to deal with it. I had never seen it and had never been in a courtroom. And then suddenly when the manufacturer of the glove was on the witness stand for no apparent reason, they just like to have lots of witnesses. I saw it sitting on the table and I said myself, that glove is gonna be tight on me. Now, one thing about OJ Simpson, he was a great running back, but he never fumbled. He didn't fumble because OJ, like Sweetwater Clifton, uh, the Harlem Globetrotters, could wrap his hand all the way around the football. And there was no football left. He had great big hands and a great big head in a handsome way. Just based on what I saw, I slid over and started to put the glove on, slid it off again, and I marched over to Christopher Darden. In the choreography of this courtroom, all the lawyers sat side by side. The courtroom on TV looks so big. Now, it's small, right? It was a small bullshit court. <laughs> In any event, Darden and I sat next to one another. And whenever he did anything, if he made an objection, he passed me a note and put A plus, question mark. So I would give him a grade. And I'd either write C minus or shit or something on it and pass it back to him. 
And we had a friendly rivalry. So I decided that Darden had to be the next victim. And I leaned over to him and he had a fuse about that long. So far as I know, it's gotten older, but it hasn't gotten any longer. <laughs> and I said to Darden, I said, you know, Chris, you're a, a good shit, but you've got the balls of a stud field house. And he went bananas. Oh. <laughs> I said, see that glove over there? I know it won't fit OJ, and you know it won't fit OJ. And if you don't get OJ to try it on, I will. Well, he wasn't going to have that thunder stolen. Judge Hino came back into court after the recess. He walked up the little set of stairs they made him so he could get to the bench because Judge Hino's a, a handsome man, but only about 5'2". And he grabbed him by the robe. I thought it was going to come off. He said, Judge, I want Simpson to try that glove on. Uh, Johnny Cochran claimed that he was in on the deal. He wasn't. I did that all on my own. Little. And I thought Shapiro claimed that he had I the sized up the glove or something like that uh, too. Yeah, I don't accept Shapiro. Uh, no one was talking to Shapiro, and Shapiro wouldn't have noticed the size of the glove if it had been pulled on over his head. <laughs> so, <clears throat> Dyden had wanted OJ to try on the glove. Had been told, ordered by Marsha and probably Gil Garcetti, don't do it. If it doesn't fit, we'll look awful. And he plunged ahead. And for the first time in the entire trial, the pundits, the guys who couldn't try a traffic case, but tell you and I every night how we did in court that day in some big case, the pundits were saying, well, the prosecution could lose this case. Once again, truth be told, the jury didn't need me to unravel Furman, and they never were impressed by the glove. They said, as far as we're concerned, there's rubber underneath it. The fact that it didn't fit, so what? All right, a couple of questions. I know um, uh, you have a, um, so enamored to talk to you. That's why I'm going longer than I normally do. And I've read um, that you, you sort of believe in not starting going for the throat with the witness right away. You sort of kind of size them up or do like, um, what, what's your motivation for that? What's your strategy in, when you get up to the podium and not going for the jugular right away? What's the strategy? Well, I think you've got to stalk a witness. And it depends on how much access you have to the witness prior statements. If you've got a whole bunch of statements and the witness is locked in, um, there isn't much to cross-examine except to repeat the favorable things to you that he said prior to trial and put that piece in the jigsaw puzzle. If, in, as in most criminal cases, and particularly federal, I'm dealing with witnesses where we don't get to know much about what they told other people. You have to pussyfoot your way along and be careful not to get in deep doo-doo uh, before you get the other foot out of the quicksand. So it's very much feel your way as you go and keep your eye on the witness waiting for any sign of anxiety. And if there's a sign of anxiety, the next step is to lull the witness into a sense of security by asking a string of innocuous questions, and then suddenly, casually turning on the witness and saying, by the way, when you were arrested, you had a 22 revolver in your back pocket, didn't you? Amazing. It's so amazing because I, I, as you're describing it, the word stock and keeping your eyes on the, the witness, I, 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 I vision you in court, and I think to myself that really you know, tigers and, and lions who are stalking prey, they don't take their eyes off of whatever they're hunting. And they may not lurch at them right away. They may sort of try to get the best position and find a moment of weakness. And that's what you're describing is really that. Well, my lovely associate here has been in Africa and seen the lions up close, something I managed to avoid except in figurative <laughs> form, but I'm told that if you stare down one of those great beasts, as long as you're looking at them directly 
in the eye, they won't pounce. I do not hope to demonstrate that to be the fact. Well, I've seen some witnesses try to look back at you and I, you definitely pounce back at them. <laughs> Tell me about your book. So I know you, you are the last, well, Carl is still alive. Um, and I know Bob Shapiro, well, we don't talk about Bob Shapiro. <laughs> You you wrote your you're re releasing a book in June. It's written, but it's being released in June, right? It's scheduled for our June fifteenth. Tell me about the book. What's it called? And what's you're the architect of the defense, and it's about your your look back at the at, at the case and your involvement in it. I think, in retrospect, architect of the defense is the fairest description. I mean, my role changed. I was in the case long before Johnny Cotton. I was in the case because Shapiro did not want to be asked about his track record in serious criminal cases. He didn't have any. He'd never tried a murder case. And as David Margolik of the New York Times said, you're in there as a cover, aren't you? And I said, well, no, but Bob knows that try lots of But uh, that was partially true. Johnny <clears throat> had always been told, even though he didn't want the case, that if O.J. got moved downtown from Santa Monica, Johnny had to try the case. By then, I was in it as lead counsel for cross-examination, literally all the heavy witnesses. When Johnny came in, I offered to step out. I said, Johnny, I hate California. I hate the courts. I hate the fact that it takes 20 minutes to ask a two-minute question. I'm glad to go home uh, if OJ will give me permission. And he said, no, my brother, I think we'd like to keep you around for a while. And so I was so, stuck. So how did your, so I, I, I read the book um, and I think it's a, I think it's a great read. It's a, it takes you, it takes, it took me right behind the scenes to places that some of the other uh, lawyers who wrote books about the, the case did not um, did not go. Um, and you have a, a criticism at times from some of a criticism of some of your colleagues, the pace of the trial. Um, so tell me what you sort of what was the what was the goal in writing the book for you? What was the what was the reason why you decided to now after all these years to to write the book? You know, Johnny and I had a big fight that no one knew about. And it involved calling a witness named Tom Lang. Ironically, the chief detective was named Tom Lang, no relation. Didn't spell it the same, but this witness was a dream. He, he was ran part of your timeline, right? He was part of your timeline pillar. He was the timeline entry point. He saw without question the people who did her in. He wrote both sides of the letter, totally impartial. And then his lawyer had him give a Q&A to a court reporter. So there wasn't any wiggling room. And he was my smart bomb. I had him in my back pocket. He was to be my witness. And I kind of coasted through the trial. I knew without knowing anything about the tapes that Furman was not going to be very difficult to knock over. Uh, I had no idea I'd be handed a case of TNT to help me along the way. And I figured Tom Lang, if he's the last, one of the last defense witnesses to testify, no jury could ever go to that jury room and find that OJ did it. Because Tom Lang said OJ wasn't there. I know him well. He wasn't there. Then it turned out we lost all of our defense witnesses or risk having a mistrial. And after nine months, you know, as a top room trial where the most hated word in the world when you're winning is mistrial. They're horrible. And, and a retrial is, they're horrible. Oh, they're, they're brutal. Oh, it'll make you throw up on the spot. Because all of the prosecutor, everything that you did, every, everything that, every bit of strategy that you pulled out to win now is exactly gone. Exactly, exactly. And Marsha Clark said, if you guys get down to 11 jurors, we are having a mistrial, and she had the absolute right to call for it. 
So, so we so were again, in turmoil. Oh, go ahead. Johnny said, let's eliminate, let's eliminate Tom Lang. They may tie him up for six weeks and we lose two more jurors and uh, Gonzo. And I said, Johnny, I'm gonna get it. I know the defending celebrity requires a notch higher than defending the average guy. Reasonable doubt is not enough. You've got to show they didn't do it or they'll never get their life back. I wanna to put Tom Lang on. We gotta take a chance on it. And we went to private room and did everything but duke it out. The only argument I ever had in my life with a guy of whom I thought and still think the world. And at the end of the day, I had to say, you know, someone's gonna say all the defense lawyers wanted to eliminate Lang, but Bailey wanted to call him because Bailey's looking for something for Bailey. It's time for me to cave in. And I did. And it left a sour spot in my stomach. And even then, I underestimated the opprobrium, which would be dumped in my lap when OJ got acquitted. People all over the world who were white said, I know he's guilty. Bailey got him off. I heard judges, particularly in the South, red in the face, tell me to my face, I had prostituted my talents and the bar set about to take my ticket and they did. So we both paid a heavy price. Meanwhile, everywhere OJ goes except for his neighborhood where his friends know OJ couldn't kill anyone, but if he did, he'd talk them to death. That's the only legal weapon he's got. And he's a wonderful, affable talker. We both had to bear that burden and he certainly has carried his share. I had to wait 25 years for an impartial audience. And I won't know if I've got one till this book either makes it or breaks it. But should people not buy this book, which has revealed wisdom, throughout his pages. I'll go to my grave saying, and they were all assholes except for me. Well, don't put me in that category because I bought it and I liked it. You didn't even know this. I didn't even tell you. You're in a club. <laughs> if you guys actually went and looked it up, if you could figure out who bought advanced copies of the book, I didn't even say it. I already bought an advanced copy of the book before um, I, you guys sent me a, a, a you know, a, a, a reader's version to yes. a preview with you. Yeah, so. and, and, I, and I'm amending it. The copy you have is being amended slightly because I think the Cochrane battle behind closed doors and the way it was resolved needs to be told, even it's though John is no longer around to give his version. But Lee, it's um, a good, it's a, it's a good story. It's a you the, the since that trial the phrase dream team has been thrown around to any by any three people that come up with enough money to hire two lawyers for a case and people <laughs> scrabble around and go oh there's the dream team and the the reality is is that you guys uh you know i mean really the stars of the show were you johnny cochran obviously barry sheck was what you know he was tremendous in the, the witnesses he had from new york we called it he and peter newfeld but i i've got to tell you uh the blame belongs with the guy who's been around the longest and should have known better and in my view i kind of blew it if i had had the presence of mind and i didn't know dna well enough at that point, to have them test the inside of that glove to see whether Simpson was there, would have killed him. Or whether Joe Gonzalez from Cuba was there, perennial hitman, or whether anything was there, it could have changed the course and the duration of the trial. And I never thought of it until it was too late. For all I know, the prosecution did test the glove, found there was no OJ in there, and withheld that fact from me and thee and the rest of the public. Well, I could hear you. I, I read about that. That's the first I've ever heard. Now, we've heard of touch DNA and cellular DNA, and 
But that's the first I've ever heard when I read the book. That's the first I ever heard of any suggestion by anybody ever that the inside of a glove should be tested, not just for blood, but even for, you know, just just touch and, DNA. And the hair from the hand would have had you, you had a you had a you had a phrase for that in the book. What's the the hair in your hand is called a certain type of hair? A limb hair. Rim hair, yes. Limb. Yes. It was a good read. I thought it was, it, it read quickly to me. I enjoyed the behind the scenes. I thought you were made an honest assessment of different things. It wasn't a beat your chest and shine your own Apple book. I thought it was, um, I, and I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. But um, Lee, look, history is gonna, is going to put you, uh, whether you currently have a bar license or not, history is gonna put you among the greats because that's where you belong. You're one of the all time great lawyers. And I hope that a generation of lawyers my age and younger um, will be able to, to read your book and to read your other books and listen to this podcast and to realize that we're in, in the, the presence of, of, uh, of a true great. Well, I that. If, when they, if when they lay me to my rest, you notice a couple of horns popping out here. <laughs> You'll know I am in fact the goat. <laughs> Here, here's it. <laughs> I like it. I thought you were going to go someplace else with that, but you are the goat, Lee. Well, I, I watched you on a show. Who was it? I watched you on one of those old talk shows back in the day where you were so cool. You had a, you had a tight three-piece suit on, and you were sitting there, and you were, you were drinking a cup of, I don't know what it was, and you were smoking a cigarette, and I thought, that's just the coolest cat in the room. <laughs> He's still the coolest cat. Coolest cat in the room. So, Lee, if there's anything else you want to talk about, I'm open. Otherwise, I know I've taken up enough of your time. I, you can tell I don't fawn very often. I am um, so honored that you graced, gave me an hour uh, or more of your time. And uh, I'm blessed to, to say that, uh, that I had this time with you. If anything else you want to share, I would love to hear it. I'd like to leave you with a quote from Potter Stewart who years ago was wrestling with a definition satisfactory to the US Supreme Court of pornography. Oh. And he finally threw in the towel and said, I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. I'd be surprised if Potter Stewart did, but he was a good Ohioan. And I say to you, I can't define a good trial lawyer but I know one when I see one. I very much appreciate that. That's the highest honor I can receive. Thank you very much, Lee. Killer, killer, killer cross-examination. A podcast by your host, the nationally renowned criminal defense attorney, Neil Rockheim.